Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 14, Episode 49. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Wednesday, Steelers Nation. Dave, the old adage is you never know what you're going to wake up to, and that is true today. It's uh, 1030 Eastern time here, just starting the day off, and there's already a ton of news to talk about, including something big happening in Cleveland. So a lot to tackle. How are you doing, Dave? Yeah, doing great. Happy Wednesday to everybody listening. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we do have a lot to uh, to get to today. Obviously, big uh, game coming up uh, on Sunday in Cleveland against the Browns. So uh, why don't you start uh, rattling off all the things that have happened here? Yeah, the biggest news is that Cleveland Browns starting quarterback Deshaun Watson out for the season due to a fractured shoulder. This news comes as a total surprise. That injury was not known, not reported until the Browns themselves made the announcement that Watson will have surgery and uh, will not play this season. The initial thought was he had the ankle injury. He was in a boot following Sunday's come from behind win over the Baltimore Ravens, and he does have a high ankle sprain, but that is not the big issue here. It is that the fractured shoulder apparently suffered in the second quarter of that game, according to Browns GM Andrew Barry. So Watson, of course, not playing this weekend against the Steelers. They will turn back to veteran PJ Walker, who has struggled this year in five games, completing under half his passes, one touchdown, five interceptions. Don't want to call this a layup against Cleveland. It's still a tough team with a great defense, but this one is a game changer. Yeah, it is. It was uh, interesting to watch the uh, the Vegas lines dance around right after this news uh, uh, broke as well, too. I think the line was right around four, four and a half across the board uh, in, in all the Vegas locations. And right after that news broke, I think it's down to two, two and a half uh, Cleveland favorite at this point. And man, this uh, this really changes the complexion uh, of, of this game now, especially you now. Look, uh, Watson, you know, played. You know, uh, injury and all. I mean, they, they came from behind against the Ravens uh, this past week. And, you know, they obviously are sitting in a position similar to the Steelers. We're uh, six and three, and this game means a lot. And now you have to turn to a backup quarterback in, 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 in PJ Walker. And look, they still have a good defense, but on the offensive side of football, this really changes the complexion. They've now lost their starting quarterback and their starting running back. Of course, Nick Chubb getting hurt severely in that first matchup against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Watson will not make it to the rematch against the Steelers. So, yeah, to lose your top quarterback, your top running back, that offense was just finding its groove. I you know Browns fans were excited that big road win against Baltimore. Watson did play well. I see Browns fans, you know, claiming this is a Super Bowl contending team. The trade is worth it. You know, middle fingered all the haters, and this comes crashing down on them. So, what is it? Two years, 12 starts for Watson is what mm. the total is going to be. And while the injury, you know, it's, it's it's no one's fault, you have to wonder if they're regretting that massive trade and contract they gave to Sean Watson. Man, 12 games out of a possible 34 regular season games uh, at, at, at this point. And, you know, look, we, we've seen over the years that uh, that teams can. Uh, uh, can can rip the band aid off and and those kind of things, but uh, it it really does feel like they're going to have to maybe try it one more year for because of the financial investment and the cap uh, re repercussions. So, uh, going to be interesting to see what happens with them after this season. But you know, you got all that guaranteed money and in, in, involved, and uh, you only have uh, twelve games out of them at this point. That's certainly not, you know, it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to figure out that uh, <laughs> uh, that doesn't look like a great decision at this point. Sure. And he's going to be back in 2024. No question about that. And he, he was playing better, but it's it just always something in Cleveland. Even when things start to look good, they just come crashing down. It's the anti Pittsburgh where the Browns, they might have the glitz and the glamour and uh, the sizzle of a team that might be able to compete, but they find ways to drop the ball. Pittsburgh may lack some of that, but they find ways to compete and, win despite 
on paper, poor looking circumstances, but either way, that's the matchup on Sunday. It'll be PJ Walker and you can bet it'll be a healthy dose of that Cleveland Browns running game. I would, uh, I would expect that. From the Steelers' side, some uh, injury-related things. On a positive note, the Pittsburgh Steelers have officially opened tight end Pat Frymuth's uh, 21-day window to return to practice. He will practice with the team on Wednesday, and according to Mike Tomlin during his Tuesday press conference, seemed pretty optimistic about his chances to play against the Browns this Sunday. So have to go through the week of practice, see what his availability is, but I think odds are pretty good. Frymuth will be a- activated off of IR come Saturday and play Sunday against the Browns. It certainly feels that's the way that that's trending. And Mike Tomlin uh, said during his press conference, feel good about Pat Firemuth. And we'll watch him through the week and look at the quality of his work and the amount of it and how he feels and let that be a determining factor, but feel good about his potential availability. So barring any sort of uh, kind of, kind of setback, uh, I would bet on him being on the field against Cleveland. Yeah, I would too. Now, snap count, I don't know exactly what that might look like after the long layoff, but it's been a tough year for Frymuth. Getting him back will be you know, helpful, and hopefully he's targeted and involved a bit more than what he had been. Eight catchers through his first three and a half games before going down with that hamstring injury against the Texans. So uh, a boost for the offense. And really, once Frymuth comes back, this offense will be healthy. The line's good. The, the quarterback's good. The running back's good. Deontay Johnson's back. Knock on wood here. Nothing happens in practice, but should be really a full slate of Steelers this Sunday. Yeah, look, I mean, you, you go back to week one, right? You lost uh, uh, Deontay Johnson. Of course, that you know, was a blowout at that time. But uh, early in the second half, you lost him. You lost Anthony McFarlane uh, uh, after that game a- a- as well. Boy, what other injuries have they had? Uh, you lost a couple of linemen uh, mm-hmm. for, for, for a game there. And, you know... Uh, Obviously, Kenny got bounced around a little bit in in in, in a game or two, so it, it will be nice. And and obviously, fireman has been out several weeks now, uh, and it will be it will be good to see. Hopefully, you know, knock on wood, all these guys can can make it through the rest of the week, and we can start getting a look of, uh, at, at what that offense was in, in, intended to be, at least from a personnel standpoint. Sure, I mean, how many snaps have the starting offense played together? fully this season that's only been the 49ers game right before Johnson got hurt because once Johnson came back Frymuth was out mm. so I mean, you've not really had a full deck of cards to work with mostly healthy especially in recent weeks and the running back uh, tandem has been healthy and that's really important but yeah it will be nice to see what this offense can look like fully healthy well you got uh what uh uh eight games left now uh what what can what can Frymuth uh, hit in, 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 in these eight games. Hopefully something significant and it's hard to put a number 30, 30 catches thinking hit 30 more moving forward. I mean, it, it feels a bit of a stretch just considering how run heavy this offense is and rightfully so in Frymuth's lack of involvement in the middle of the field type stuff, not really being there. And, you know, Frymuth really wasn't targeted in weeks two and three, even with the Ante out. And you thought that'd be a moment where he would soak up a lot of targets. So, more red zone play will hopefully give him some more chances. Does have two touchdowns this year, both in the red zone. It's just, it's hard to say, but just hopefully having that element out there is going to be, you know, obviously a boost and they're going to need it against a, a really talented Browns defense. And I know the message message in Cleveland right now, Dave is this is like 2019 Steelers defense of Cleveland Browns defense. You got to do it all. Like you are the anchor. You are driving this bus to get us where we want to go. So they're going to have that mentality of we got to take the ball away. We got to give our offense short fields. We got to really rally here as our quarterback is done for the season. What would you put as an over and under for, for, from, from this point forward with uh, Pat Fryermuth and receptions? Uh, 21 and a half, I'll say. uh, To get, to get action on both sides, you'd say 21 and a half. I'd say 23, 23 and a half. I'll go, I'll go two more. Uh, uh, than you, uh, and look, he needs to, right. You got a potential with him of, of, of him, you know, looking for maybe a contract after the contract extension after the season. So it would behoove him to at least, at least hit that number 23 and a half, you know, and, and, uh, over if you can get it. Yeah, I'll gladly take the over on that. Some other roster moves uh, from the Pittsburgh Steelers, including the fry move designated to return, opening the window, the team. Resigning nose tackle Braden Pahoko to the practice squad. He was released the other day, and he circles back to the practice squad as the D-line has gotten healthier. 
Team also adding a linebacker, Tyler Murray, to the practice squad. He's out of Memphis, was with the Bengals, as obviously the team has had a bunch of injuries at inside linebacker. Uh, Quan Alexander officially on IR with the Achilles. Um, that was reported as the torn Achilles. Tomlin never said specifically it was a torn Achilles, but he said it was Achilles, and we can all put two and two together. So really feel for Quan Alexander having a good season, you know, one-year deal, trying to get paid, trying to hang around for next year, and now his future is very much in doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Especially as we talked the other day, you know, uh, what's going to happen after that, after, after that, you know, contract expires and coming off this injury. So uh, very untimely for him, especially with that being a second Achilles injury. But, uh, big thing now is, uh, just see if he can, uh, rehab this thing as quickly as possible. And man, you, you go from a luxury as Mike Tomlin said it, uh, at the li- inside linebacker position to losing uh, two of your main guys inside back-to-back weeks. So uh, Mike Tomlin talked a little bit about that on, on, on Tuesday there about how they uh, may or may not, you know, at least from the overview here is, and it's not surprising. I think maybe we, we said as much the other day, the likelihood of them going outside the organization especially when you look at some of these other practice squads and all like that probably wasn't likely to happen. And in so many words, Mike Tomlin said that wasn't going to happen on Tuesday that they'll, they'll deal with this in internally now. Yeah. And there's really no choice trying to bring in an outsider to not only play, but be a central communicator in your defense is really tough to do. And so I think you have to at least start internally and, you know, if you're just trying to get guys off of practice squads or, you know, off the street, guys that aren't conditioned, aren't NFL ready, that's asking a lot. So there are some internal options. We'll, we'll talk about it probably some more here and we'll see how things look on Sunday, obviously, Landon Roberts and Mark Robinson going to see the bulk of the action there. Just to kind of put a bow on the other practice squad moves, Pittsburgh released two players off their practice squad on Tuesday. That is offensive lineman Joey Fisher. He was a small school kid out of Shepard and tight end, kind of that move athletic tight end Scotty Washington uh, was released as well. So just want to wrap those moves up um, overall. So let's transition now to the Mike Tomlin press conference and kind of touched on some of the things he talked about already, the injuries, the linebacker situation. Not that there's an easy way to handle it, Dave, but how would you handle the new look inside linebacker room given the injuries to Holcomb and Alexander? Yeah, look, uh, I think uh, first and foremost, you know, Landon Roberts going to going to see more playing time uh, at, at this point, and spe- specifically when you're talking about run uh, situations, Mike Tomlin would not say who's going to wear the green dot at this point, but. It, it feels like you don't have many choice, especially if Minka's not back this week. Uh, uh, you know, so that's obviously something to watch when it comes to him. But uh, a Landon, you, you, that might be your first option just to see how it goes. And Mike Tomlin talked about, you know, he has played in coverage in the past and all like that. I mean, yeah, he has, but how great has it been? You know, uh, not this good. is <laughs> not uh, good, Bob. Right. Uh, this is a this is a downhill guy, and if they can isolate him, uh, which, you know, you got to think if he even in early downs, you know, first to 10 situations, if he's on the field, you know, teams are going to maybe try to pass in some of those situations and, and get him isolated uh, one on one. So uh, it's probably going to be him. It's probably going to be Mark Robinson. We talked a little bit about, you know, what what maybe could you do with a guy like Keanu Neal? Uh, but. There's there's not many options overall when you think about it. Look, they're gonna pro- they're you know we'll, by the end of the week we'll probably have a couple more uh, guys off the practice squad on the 53 man roster or at least on the active roster uh, via elevations there and in 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 in, in M- Mikel Walker and uh, who's the other one there? Tariq also, Carpenter. Yeah, Tariq Carpenter there. Tariq Car- uh, Walker has a lot more playing type playing time experience than than uh, than Tariq Carpenter does so. You know, you, you, there's probably going to be some mix and matching going on. You're going to be busy with some with some charting, I would imagine, uh, again. But I think it starts with a Landon Roberts and and Mark Robinson and flipping those guys around first and foremost. Yeah, I mean, in terms of Green Dot, I mean, it's pretty obvious that Roberts is going to be the Green Dot guy. Tomlin talked up his, you know, quarterback mentality and being a communicator and having that background before wearing the Green Dot. So, I, I mean. 
he doesn't have to be the only one. You can't have, you know, multiple helmets that have, you know, communication capability. They just can't be on the field as, field as, at the same time. And so maybe Minka gets it if he comes back. Maybe, maybe they do something else, um, you know, alongside that. But Roberts is going to be the key guy. And yeah, in, in coverage, it's not his forte. I think Tomlin was stretching it a little bit by saying just because we haven't asked him to do it doesn't mean that he can't do it. There's a reason why he's been playing in base and, you know, run packages and not playing in nickel that much. And, not playing in dime at all. So it's going to be a strain for him. But how do you balance the athleticism concerns versus the um, communication concerns? Communication comes first. And so that's going to be what this team is going to be driven by in terms of keeping guys on the same page as opposed to trying to put the best athletes out on the field. And, and you know, not, not to uh, uh, knock on Mark Robinson here, but there, there is probably some concerns with him fully still understanding this defense and, and properly communicating it out. And the reason that that's come to the forefront, in my opinion, is, you know, the inside the NFL edition that aired Tuesday night. There was a which, by the way, if you haven't seen that, it's absolutely the, the Steeler segment. And, and there's absolutely fantastic uh, because they have an interview with, 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 with Cam Hayward in there, but they show some mic'd up segments in there and pres- presumably not long after, uh, Quan Alexander left that game with the injury, you know, he's talking right to Mark Robinson's saying, look, you know, we've got to communicate, you know, you, it's not going to be all on you. So it, my takeaway from that segment is that they're, they want Mark Robinson to kind of take that next step when it comes to communicating this stuff out and, you know, look, he's, he, he's how many snaps has Mark Robinson played on, on the defensive side of football total there? There's not a lot. It's still probably under a hundred, isn't it? Oh yeah. He played, he's played four this season. Well, coming into the game, I should say he played four. Uh, and then last year he probably played 40 something or so. Yeah. So we're, we're talking, yeah, under 100 snaps. It, it's a small body work. He's got 89, guy. 89 in total defensive snaps. Now, obviously, you got preseason and all, you know, all that kind of stuff there. But I mean, 89 meaningful snaps uh, right now. And how many of those, you know, uh, were him having to com- get the call and, and relay yeah. it, relay it out and all like that. So hey, here's the thing when it comes to guys like. Uh, uh, Walker and, 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 and Robinson and Tariq and all like that, you're probably going to have a good understanding of who those guys are by the end of the season. Right. Sure. But I think that's all the reason why they're going to, they may treat Roberts as that three down guy, as much as they don't want to have him out there and dime. If he's the best communicator, what's more important an right. athlete, a linebacker or communication, it's communication. And maybe you can try to minimize some of the, athletic concerns by having them blitz more or just kind of different schematic things, but communication is going to be the number one thing this defense needs. And they had issues in that, obviously in that game, you look at the first play after Quan went down, what happened, Dave gave up a touchdown, right? The one snap that Roberts did not play after Alexander went down touchdown 35 yards to, to Jane Reed on third and 16. So when you had those communication switches and changes, you had literal touchdowns on the two plays that had happened. And so the, and you saw, them really have some pre-snap chaos and DeMonte Casey after the game talking about not being on the same page. And so communication is the number one thing for this defense. And they're going to sacrifice, you know, not having a great athlete at linebacker if it means having more stable and more trustworthy communication. Probably an uptick in zone. I would think so. You look at this game, they played, uh, how much cover two did they play in this game against Green Bay? A ton late in that game. And some of that's because they didn't have the athletes a corner to run with those receivers and I think they were just trying to simplify things overall. So whatever they do is going to be, I think, pretty simple schematically just to try to make sure, try to lessen some of the strain on communication. Right. I I, I would think, you know, I would think that we would potentially see that in, in, in uptick in zone. I'm trying to pull up how much uh, uh, what they did uh, past defense wise in this last game against Green Bay. It had to been. Very zone heavy. I know, let me late in game, you know, they're playing zone, they're trying to play back and all that kind of stuff, but it had to been 80% probably zone coverage in this game if I had to to put a number on it. Uh, let's see here if I can divvy this up here. Uh, cover one against the Packers. See how many snaps are. Oh, I'm not, I don't have it sorted by, uh, 
I, I'm going to have to sort it in another way as we go along here, but uh, keep talking a little bit here. Yeah, but I mean, look at that game. A lot of cover, too. Some inverted cover, too. My concern for this game, specifically against the Browns, and we'll talk more about it on Friday, I know, but I know the Browns are going to go out and empty. They're going to try to you know, pick on Roberts 1v1 with Njoku. Walker's going to look his way a lot. So even though Watson is out, I still think the, the core game plan is going to be the same, and I don't think any team has had as much success against Pittsburgh going empty, you know, they're in 12 personnel, 22 personnel to keep Pittsburgh in base and then spread things out. And then you attack Roberts and Robinson. You put Cooper as number three inside and try to get some of those matchup advantages where Pittsburgh is less willing to maybe move that corner inside. Although we'll see if Joey Porter Jr. moves around a bit more in this game. And Pittsburgh has traveled their corners a bit more against twin receiver sets and, and that kind of stuff. So very interested to see how Cleveland and future opponents attack you know, Roberts and Robinson. All right. Uh, man coverage against the uh, Packers uh, in past coverage uh, situations, 12 man coverage snaps, 23 zone. Uh, I wonder what that was in the first half. Let me see if I can separate this by, by, by half here. Uh, eight man coverage, eight snaps of man coverage in the first half, 14 in zone i wonder what the first oh that's uh that's down hold on a minute here let me separate it by uh it should give me a does it give me an opportunity to no, i don't guess it does give me an opportunity to separate it by quarter here i thought it did here no. but anyway uh yeah we're, we're gonna see more zone plain and simple yeah yeah so uh what else from tomlin's presser stuck out to you dave uh, let me pull it up here real quick. Uh, what did he talk about? Did have got, got to oh, see more from Kenny. That's where know? I was going to go. Yeah. I mean, and it's true. And I had the article today. I want to get your thoughts on this, Dave, my, my new concern with Kenny Pickett. And again, I'm not concluding anything on Pickett, but my takeaway the last two games is Dave, you know, Pittsburgh's offense has gotten off the hot starts. They, they, you know, had opening possession touchdowns, had back to back scores. Uh, in the end zone against Green Bay uh, by rushing touchdowns from Najee Harris and Jalen Warren. And so you've kind of gotten that rhythmic passing game going early in the game, offense into a flow, and yet Pickett has still struggled after that, been able, been unable to sustain and and play good football really from, from there on out. So my concern is you're kind of getting what you needed, that rhythmic passing game early to get into a flow, get into a rhythm, and you're still getting kind of overall similar results. And to me, that's that's pretty concerning. Yeah, and going back through all the, the all 22 and all, now were there a lot of middle of the field uh, chances for him to make some throws in this game? Be Look, he missed some stuff coming across the middle in some shorter instances. One sticks out with, with Connor Hayward uh, on, on a crossing route that uh, – uh, that 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 he turned down. I think he threw to the right side, and that ended up being a drop to Najee, if I'm not mistaken. There, uh, there were some shorter middle of the field stuff that I think that he turned around. Now I'm not talking a lot uh, uh, stuff like, look, they they could still run, stand to run more uh, slants and stuff like that, right? You know, uh, those kind of things. We're still not seeing a, a huge uptick in that kind of stuff there. But as far as uh, down the field. Uh, middle of the field uh, kind of opportunities where he had the ability to to maybe rip one. I, I didn't come away feeling like there were a lot of those. Now, there were some instances on the outside, I thought, where he may have turned been, been able to turn some loose on some some deeper throws on, on and all like that. It, it, it feels like what they call that a Venn diagram. Uh, 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 does Kenny see man coverage <laughs> uh, on the outside? If so, uh, throw deep outside the numbers. If not, uh, think about short uh, over the middle or or checking down. It, it, it really feels like it's simplified as as much as that. And man, man, you, I mean, you look at the passing charts on him. You know, uh, not obviously against Green Bay, but going back the last several games or really the season as a whole. He's not throwing to the middle of the field, you know, and, you know, people say, well, look, the, the concepts aren't, aren't great and all like that. Sure. That's going to be part of it, but there are instances where he's had to turn this thing, uh, you know, where he should have maybe cut some of these loose, loose overall, but 
Still, the completion percentage is not where you want to see it at this point. Uh, the third third and long situations obviously are concerning. Uh, they were, what did we say they were one of one of six or one of seven on third down uh, in the second half of that game. There are going to be instances where he's going going to need to going to need to make some throws down the field, and that's that's a big big element to this I think moving forward uh and it's why it's imperative for them to run the foot run the football good on early downs to get in some shorter uh situations here because I think one of the most concerning aspects on him uh is, is his completion percentage overall and his ability to move the change on third and long situations I think you're thinking flow chart more than Venn diagram for the, uh, okay. the picket uh, outside of the numbers, but, but I agree with the overall thought. I mean, I, you know, looking back at that Packers game, he wasn't asked to do a whole lot in that game. I mean, obviously you run for two Oh five. That's kind of where you're focused on. You're playing from ahead. And I know, you know, after that hot start, the running game, it, it went quiet for a while. And there was some more pressure that I think people, you know, understand. And, Pittsburgh got backed up in some and long situations to force some of those check downs to guys like Connor Hayward. But I just look at this game and sit there and say, just kind of missing some of the routine stuff, routine reads, obviously the, the, the fast four to Warren in the flat that, you know, could have been a lateral there. And you know, that ball is not, not placed well. And that one, you know, it's just, just a play that you have to make every single time and pick it had been until that point. Um, to me, I thought his biggest issue was just kind of locking onto his first street. Look at some right. of those sideline throws at Deontay Johnson one to warn in the flat where you're just not really reading things cleanly and not getting off your first read to get to your second read or try to find a better option. So I didn't see a lot in this game middle of the field wise that was open that he turned down. I don't know if there really was a whole lot available to him, but just in terms of the decisions that he actually made, I I know he, you know, played clean football from the standpoint of zero interceptions and he's got five straight games without a pick, which is remarkable. It's really impressive uh, sincerely, but you know, there were some risky throws and just some some balls where you just can't make, especially in a game where you're not really asked to do a whole lot. Throw the ball 24 times, you're playing from ahead overall. Um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of pressure on him to make a lot of big time throws and the throws that, you know, he kind of needed to make or the, the decisions that were poor. You just want to see him be able to to get past. Look, there, like it or not, there's a luck component to his game so far this season. I mean, depending on what, what, uh, because it, it, it it's, it's subjective uh, you know, along with drops and all you know with, with, with wide receivers but he's gotten away with some interception worthy throws and you know, once again depending on what site you want to go by I mean we're talking anywhere from like eight to eight to 13 I think you know yeah I mean I don't know how that compares to other guys I think those metrics are out there I hadn't looked at them and sometimes yeah, is that a communication thing I mean I think any quarterback sure. that goes five games without a pick probably has a bit of luck in their favor sure Sure, I, I I would agree with that, and and look, them not turning the football over is playing a huge part in them being able to win uh, these games. So, I mean, you you can't just shove that to the side, and you don't want him. I mean, look what Josh Allen did the other night, right? You know, right. Uh, uh, where where is the happy medium of attacking down the field with? And this is the NFL. Some of these some of these times, you're going to have to 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 take uh, risky. Uh, tight, tighter window throws there. It it feels like when his completion percentage does go up, though, and that when they are moving it kind of incrementally down the field, it's outside the numbers, mm-hmm. and there's not a lot of yak attached to it. Yeah, I think he likes the clean picture of I got one B one. Let's go attack it, and that's when he's at his best. And to me, looks and feels the most comfortable. Like his best throw in that game, his two best throws were sideline throws to Deontay on that kind of comeback in the back shoulder to George Pickens. So that's when he and gets that, kind and of that those... one to the left. He look, he can sling it across the field from the far hash and mm-hmm. make those throws. That that's that's not the question. We've talked we talked about this in the recap. He can make. He's he's making some NFL throws that you want to see him make. What we're not seeing though is some of the uh, the the tighter window and and down the field throws, you know, inside the numbers. Right, where that picture gets more muddied, and some of that post snap picture can change based on coverages and rotations. I, I think you see him struggle there, and the accuracy, even just some of that more routine stuff, you know, horizontal crossing routes, his accuracy 
tends to dip. Balls are high. Balls are behind. Not yak opportunities. Not often enough. It's happened. I mean, he's, had, he's thrown some good yak balls, but I don't see it consistently enough for a guy that was supposed to be super hyper accurate um, overall. So again, I, I know it. I, I don't want to spend the whole podcast talking about Kenny Pickett's struggles. I, I know I've kind of introduced the topic here, but just my takeaway was just okay. The offense finally got going. Got into a rhythm. You got some kind of free yards off play action, off boots. You know, the Pickett's first two drives were, were fine overall against Green Bay. Why did it die out so quickly after that? When, once you were playing with the lead, things were good. There's some context to it. Again, some you know negative plays that, that hurt Pickett, hurt this offense. But it just felt like, okay, you finally got the start that you wanted. Why couldn't you finish that thing out? I, and another thing that's missing too, and it's not something that obviously you go in wanting to see happen a lot, but it, but you're, you're, you know, your top 10 quarterbacks in the league at least make a habit out of two or three times a, a game extending a play for a big play. Yeah. I mean, we haven't seen we haven't much seen of that. that, have we? To, to your point. Yeah. I mean, I haven't, I haven't necessarily missed it because I want to see this guy play in some rhythm. And I think he's done a good job of staying in the pocket more often. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, when you can make those plays, those things can be explosive chunk plays waiting to happen. Uh, and I think really the best way to kind of sum up this talk, because once again, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to spend, spend this entire show saying y'all you did, all you guys did was, was knock on Kenny, but, but Mike Tomlin put it as bluntly, uh, uh you know, as, as he could, you know, he, he was asked, how do you evaluate Kenny's performance and do you need to see more from him moving forward? He says, certainly. Man, we're going to need more, particularly as this road narrows. But guys like Kenny Pickett and myself, man, we're measured by wins and losses. He and I, I talk about that often and openly. We know what our jobs are. Our jobs are to win. And so that's where we are. That's where our focus is. You know, I love the fact that he embraces that down in and down. You know, just kind of paints it from there on out. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's not like we're going to start on Wednesday working on these things. You know, it's really a continuation of what he has said all season. We're going to continue to work on it. Uh, till we get the desired result. But I think the, the I think the most important uh, part of that answer that he gave was the first word, certainly. I agree. And, and that's partially why I wrote the article, because if you look, listen to Tomlin Pressers earlier in the season, you kind of get the same question about Pickett. How do you get him going? How do you get him on track? Kind of get this passing game going. And his answer was always, got to find a rhythm early. Got to have some rhythmic passes. And to me, that was kind of more of a shot at, at Canada of, hey, we got to get this guy with some easy wins early in drives, early in football games, you know, quick game, boot game, all that kind of stuff. And you've gotten that against Tennessee and against Green Bay. I think you've had some really good opening scripts that have been successful, put the ball in the end zone. So you've, you've found that rhythm you've been searching for all season early in games. And yet the results after that have been, you know, I think pretty lackluster. Now, again, against Tennessee had a great deep ball to Deontay that helped win that game, game winning drive. But there were so many missed chances prior to that, that, you know, should have had Pittsburgh playing from ahead throughout the game, as opposed to needing a come from behind victory. And against green Bay, it just felt like it was really nothing to even talk about, but just, you know, not, not strong play overall and some missed chances and some poor reads from, from Kenny Pickett. So um, that's just the part that gets me. You finally get an offense on track early and you, you struggle to sustain that especially against Green Bay that was down their top mm. corner a week secondary over. I really thought Dave like this. I thought I, Sunday against Green Bay was going to be like Pickett's game. Pickett, I, Pickett's I thought was it was too. Game. I, I yeah, thought we just, could see 300 in that game. Yeah, like have that big statement game against a defense that was hurting, you know, on the road coming to your place. And he just, you saw nothing of that. He, he throws for a buck 26. And again, you run for 205. They ran the ball a lot. They play with a lead. But there were some chances there for some bigger plays that just did not happen. You know, it, it seems like when we're talking about explosive plays right now in the passing game, it feels like it's 1v1 outside the number situations. It seems like... Uh, 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 either either over the you know, over the top dropping it in a bucket that way. It seems like it's a back shoulder to to George Pickens is another way that they're getting it. And the other way is when they run you know some sort of a divide you know situation with with either uh, uh, Pickett or, or or Calvin Austin down the middle of the field uh, up over the top of the heads. Dave, whenever Frymuth gets back on the field, which we presume will be Sunday. Do you think they're going to use that area more, hopefully some for some more big plays, or is the concern it's going to be the way the first couple weeks look where even though Frymuth was in there, even though Deontay Johnson was out, that area was still not really utilized? Man, I would like to think that you can at least a couple of times a game try to uh, isolate uh, 
Firemuth up the seam, you know, mm-hmm. uh, get, get, get a coverage on them on, on a linebacker or safety or something along those lines, maybe work in, start working in some more play action, uh, with, with this offense to, to, to make it, you know, let that, you know, hopefully be a, a, a kind of first read situation, but you know, they look, what, whatever is going to get you, they have three explosive plays in the passing game over the last three games, Alex. Mm, that is not good enough. You know, and yeah, I mean, look, I uh, praise praise the heck out of them for what they've been getting out of the running game with the explosive plays, right? You know, mm-hmm. but how, how sustainable uh, is that? I mean, it's good to see. We talk about it all the time, man. It'd be nice to see Najee uh, uh, get some explosive plays. He's he's getting those uh, this year, but you know, it's not the kind of thing that I think that you're going to uh, uh, see on a week in week out basis, getting two or three of those, you might get one of them, but where are the rest of your explosive plays, uh, going to come from, uh, they, they've got to come in the passing game. So, and how many of those are going to be catch short run long, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you've got to figure out a way other than outside the numbers on back that, you know, sure. You might get one, uh, one, one or two a game. If you're lucky on, on some back shoulders to, to pickings, right. You might get one, uh, down the field outside the numbers, dropping in, in, in into the bucket. Uh, we need to start seeing five, six, seven explosive plays total a game from this offense. If, you know, a, 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 at some point here, at least five a game, you know, I mean, to me, what I really want to see just to start is just the routine stuff. I mean, I think since the Jacksonville game, there's been some routine things there from Pickett that have been missed. And just in terms of clean reads and throwing an accurate ball and when something's open, hit it. And I know, I think in week eight, especially, you know, the rib issue, you know, can be a factor. And, and that's something to, to talk about and, and discuss. There's no question about that. Um but I just feel like there's just been some meat left on the bone and if Pittsburgh was just making the place that were there and were open and, and just hitting that, then we're talking about a different offense. We're talking about an offense that's getting near 30 points and having a couple of really strong performances overall, a complete game uh, that they're playing. And it's a totally different equation about how you look and view pick it in this offense. If you just hit the stuff that you're supposed to hit and the stuff that's there. Yeah. I mean, we're not seeing those deep, dig ins, you know, on, on, on daggers or mills or anything, you know, uh, one other concept that they tried to try to run that, you know, obviously didn't work out because of a penalty is they, they, you know, ran the Yankee, uh, concept to, uh, to, to pickings, but how many times the games, you know, are, are, are you going to, uh, you know, be able to, to, to run that successfully at all. And look, once again, uh, there were some situations in this game against the Packers where, you know, pressure, you know, didn't allow for him to take some of these shots there. But, uh, you know, I, I, I just think you we've got to start seeing more from him uh, past 10 yards, past the line of mm-hmm. scrimmage, wherever, sure. it, wherever it is. Right, right. Now I'm with you there. All right, Dave, uh, getting off of that, uh, what else from Tomlin? I think those were kind of the, the bulk of the things that he had to say. Um, anything else to caught your attention from his presser? Uh, let me scroll through, you know, obviously praised up uh, Miles Garrett, Mr. Garrett. Uh, yeah. we went from uh, Mr. Chubb to Mr. Garrett, uh, really had a lot of great things to, 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 to say about, uh, Keanu Benton and, and with good reason, uh, saying you can't deny what basically what you're seeing on tape uh, with him. And, you know, that obviously is, 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 is good to hear and see on the tape there. Uh, what else? You asked a lot about the linebackers. Oh, the whole Jalen Warren thing, uh, and all like that. Look, I mean, yeah, he deserved to be announced, uh, as a starter, uh, uh, this past week because, you know, he's, he's worked hard. Now, does that mean he's going to be, I think, was it Bleacher Report that had kind of the clickbaity title, you know, yesterday there? Uh, this, this is going to be on a game by game basis with this running back group, but Najee's still officially the starter. Uh, and you probably are going to start seeing more even snap counts with these two and, and even distribution with these two. So that that's probably not a huge surprise, uh, mm-hmm. at, at the, especially the way those two are working together. Uh, and, 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 and the output that they're giving you right now. Yeah, they're keeping each other fresh. They're running hard. They're they're kind of grinding teams down late. Um, I think this offense still has to close out some of these games. A better four minute offense would be ideal. Not make your defense have to make these last second stands the way that there's been the last two weeks. But you know you're getting closer in that direction. So yeah, my thoughts always been it's it's a timeshare. It's a split. It's a committee. Harry still plays a bit more in early downs. Warren certainly your your third down pass down situation 
type of running back, but you've seen Warren get an uptick in, in early down snaps and some more opportunities, and rightfully so. He runs hard. He's an energy bringer. Again, you can debate Harris versus Warren all you want. I'm just happy both guys are Pittsburgh Steelers because they need this run game to be successful. That's the model of how they won you know, the back half of last year, how they're winning right now. And so you need both guys healthy, available, and ready to contribute. And I think both guys have you know played well, especially these last two weeks. Knowing Jim Schwartz, the defensive coordinator, oh, uh, also probably need to hit uh, coming in this morning that uh, sounds like maybe Dorian uh, – DTR is going to start for the Browns potentially. Oh, really? Where is that? Uh, is that from the Browns? Uh, that's from the... Schwartz. Uh, not Schwartz. Uh, the Fansky? Uh, no, no. The, uh, the report, uh, oh. uh, reporter, which is Schultz Schultz. Oh, Jordan Schultz. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's reporting that, uh, the, the Browns are planning to start Dorian Thompson Robinson against the Steelers. Oh. Not, not, uh, not, not PJ. All right. That's interesting. Well, that's really interesting. I mean, Walker has struggled. Thompson Robinson had one start this year. That was whenever people thought Watson was going to play against Cleveland or against Baltimore in week four. And then 90 minutes before kickoff, Watson says, I can't go. DTR has to get in there and he gets crushed by Baltimore. They get blown out and, and, and lose that game. They turn to Walker whenever they needed to, to go to somebody in the future. He's an athletic guy, had a great summer rookie out of UCLA, um, but he looked overwhelmed there in that first game. So Interesting decision there. I did not expect that. And Mary Kay Cabot's followed that up saying Andrew Barry wouldn't say who will start at quarterback versus the Steelers on Sunday, saying, of course, Browns have P.J. Walker and Dorian Thompson, Thompson Robinson. But uh, Schultz uh, uh, this morning says the Browns are planning to start rookie Dorian Thompson Robinson at quarterback. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Another another twist to this. Yeah, just more twists and turns. What a. What a Wednesday overall, but yeah, just to, to back, back, back to what um, I was asking about, about Schwartz, uh, based on his background and all like that, what, what are you wanting to try to accomplish against the Steelers, uh, this week? I mean, you, you've got the onus has got to be take away the run, right? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. I think that's going to be the MO for most teams here on out and make Kenny Pickett make, make this passing game beat you. And, and obviously when you see a, Pittsburgh unit that ran for a buck 66 and 205 over the last two games. The focus is on taking away the run. So I think you're going to put eight men in the box. You're going to, um, even against 11 personnel, you're going to trust your corners. They have good corners to play on the outside, assuming that Denzel Ward plays. I imagine that he will. He's got a minor neck issue. Um, so yeah, you're going to, you're going to, you know, be aggressive. You're going to, uh, play eight man fronts and you're going to really try to, to wait, take away that run and make Pickett, you know, win with his arm. Right. I, I'm daring. I'm daring Kenny Pickett to beat me with a 300 yard game. Yeah. And if you can take away the run and put him in some of those third and long situations, then Garrett gets to pin his ears. You kind of get those chaos fronts where Garrett moves around. You get some more exotic type stuff from them. So I think I think the Browns MO, probably generally speaking, is to stop the run. You play in an a AFC North, but that's kind of the, the mandate if you're playing a Baltimore or now Pittsburgh type of outfit. So I think that game plan is probably the same, but it could be more effective if they can stop the run. All right. Uh, where else? Uh, what else from Tom? Anything? No, I think it sums it up pretty well. Just listening to him on Benton. I mean, you know, if Adams comes back and that's not been, we don't know uh, Montrevis Adams status for Sunday's game, but if he does come back, I think Benton still has to start and play. And he's played a ton of snaps the last few weeks. And I thought played some really good football. Yes, uh, it's his time now. As as we stated, you know the two the toothpaste is out of the tube now. Yeah, for all these rookies, for Jones, for Porter, and for Benton, um, should note that from an injury standpoint, you know basically wait and see mode on Adams on safety, Keanu Neal, and on Minka Fitzpatrick. So Neal with the ribs, Minka with the hamstring, Adams with the ankle. We'll see what today's injury report is. Maybe those guys will be more limited early in the week, but you know. You think Minka? I don't know if I got a great vibe. About I don't. I don't, I don't have a great. I, I don't have a great read on it. Totally. Okay. okay. Uh, 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 you know, forget forget the vibe. I just I don't have a great read on it because you we know how these hamstring mm -hmm. injuries are. Now it did happen in what a Thursday. How far removed will he have been from that? Come. Uh, at least by tomorrow, because you know, he, if he can go limited today and maybe get up to full on Thursday and Friday, then uh, you know, you'd, you'd have to like his chances, right? But the the injury happened. Was it the second? It was October 29th. It was the oh, Jacksonville 29th. game okay, in the first 29th. quarter. So 
by the time the Browns game rolls around, you're about three weeks removed. These things seem to be taking about a month. You know, Deontay, I don't think avoided IR, but, you know, Deontay missed a month. Pat, with the aggravation, missed a month. I'm maybe, I'm not ruling it out, and we'll see what the base re- report is. But if I had to just guess right now, I would say he comes back to the Bengals game on the 26th. Okay. All right. I mean, obviously, and I, you know, I don't know which way this thing's going to go, uh, uh, especially when you're dealing with hamstrings. And you know, the big fear is you don't want to come back too yeah. early and then lose him for another three weeks or something uh, 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 like that. But I mean, Minka knows his body better than 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 than, mm-hmm. than anyone else. So it, you know, it might be. Look, you you got to be up front with us and let us know. You know, can, can can you go or can't you go? I don't know if we'll learn that much today. Maybe we will. Uh, uh, but obviously, if he can't go full by Thursday, you'd have to not like mm-hmm. his chances, right? Right. I'm with you there. So if not, then he can keep the headset on and keep feeding good play calls to Terrell Austin. I really like Matthew Marks' article, giving Austin credit for listening to his players. Like I know Austin, in some corners of the internet, got criticism for, oh, look at Minka calling the plays. I love a coach that's willing to accept that information from his guys and trust his guys and receive that input. And not always have to act upon it, but in that situation, he did and made the adjustment to kind of play that sticks picket fence at the goal line. I, I really appreciate a coach that, that's willing to do that. I think players play harder for coaches that are willing to listen and actually receive information from their players. Uh, and we forgot to hit on that in the show the other day, recapping the game. Mm-hmm. That, that was quite the uh, sideline exchange. It looked like uh, <laughs> Terrell Austin said, I know. I Yeah, <laughs> like three people talking to him. He's yeah. like, we all just shut yeah. up for a second. I know. It is, his eyes closed for a minute. He's got his, I know, I know. And I think, was it Grady over there uh, uh, along with Mika and all like that? But the, the key thing is they, they got to the right decision. And mm-hmm. uh and obviously, we highlighted a couple of plays in the past where they used that picket fence and, and, and all at the goal line. Look, the, the main takeaway there is he just wasn't stubborn on that, that uh, if it went down the way it's being painted as it went down, at least they got to the right decision there. Yeah, but I can just respect the coach. It's, it's not so egotistical to say, I make the calls and I don't want to hear what you guys have to say. And somebody that recognizes I got a really smart guy, Mika Fitzpatrick. Let's listen to what he thinks we should do and take that into consideration. Maybe I'll call it. Maybe I don't. But in that situation, of course, he did. So just want to make a note of that overall. It will be interesting. You would think that uh, Terrell Austin be asked about that, right, on Thursday? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm probably the first question he's going to get there. Uh, and he'll probably, you know, laugh it off about, you know, Minka being Minka. But appreciate Coach Austin and appreciate Minka for that. All right. Uh, what else? Uh, I think it's everything from Tom Lynn. Players are going to be speaking today, including, I presume, Kenny Pickett. But Dave, let's go into our, our All-22 review after watching this one. And we've already touched on the offense and Pickett. Probably not much more to add there from a run game standpoint, though. Run for 205 in this one. What made this offensive output on the ground so successful? Uh, guys on the move. Guys getting the second level. The athleticism. Just execution, execution. Uh, uh, and... Uh, and uh, on top of that, I thought there were great reads on a couple individual plays by Najee Harris and, and Jalen Warren. Uh, one, one of those, uh, uh, one of those times and look, Green Bay helped them out with uh, some of the slant slanting that they were doing, mm-hmm. uh, kind of played into the play call, uh, on, on a couple of those runs, but that's not the Steelers fault. The, the, what you're supposed to do is take advantage of those. I mean, there was a time where Cole had a nice, uh, Mason Cole had a nice free rib rib meat shot, uh, to help out, uh, Isaac Sayamalo ended up making I, Isaac fall over his guy. It was such a good, uh, 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 rib shot there. And then Cole's able to get out to the second level, uh, things that we just did not see early in the season uh, with them. Obviously, Broderick able to get off the ball as quickly as he is able to do get to the second level. Uh, I thought James Daniels, especially that first quarter and a half, what a game mm-hmm. by him. Uh, uh, and, and that stuck out on the TV tape. And you get into the all 22 uh, on him. I thought just a tremendous really first half uh, overall with him. Uh, being able to cross face on some guys, being able to turn other guys out, uh, just very, very sound overall uh, uh, with him. So uh, I, I think scheme, uh, execution, and the way the Packers uh, 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 running back reads and cuts, uh, ability to get yards after first contact, which were coming 
past the line of scrimmage uh, uh, quite consistently. And then the, the Packers, the way they tried to defend some of these, I, I think you'd lump all that together and then just wearing them down at the end too. You know, there's something to be said about having to tackle a guy not only like, you know, you, you think of Jalen Warren as kind of a, a, you know, some might classify him as a change of pace guy, but don't sign me up for having to uh, <laughs> uh, put a shoulder down on him coming up the middle. Uh, regardless, I mean, that, that guy is small and compact and he, he has a physicality uh, to him that he's not going to go down after first contact with him. So once again, we, we kind of describe him as thunder and thunder and lightning, you know, uh, mm -hmm. together there. But I think all of that together, what I just highlighted was the reason you saw this team go for 200 yards. No, you said it really well, Dave. I don't have a whole lot more to add. Um, I thought first level movement up front was really good from the guards. As you said, Daniels on that first drive, just clearing paths. I thought, say, Malu doing the same. And because, as you said, the Packers had, and we talked about that, you know, that slanting kind of one gap aggressive defense can, can kind of screw blocking schemes. But when you're wrong, you're wrong. And right. you get guys out of position. And when Pittsburgh's pulling, they get extra guys. And you really have uh, some good boxes and kind of good looks to start running into. And I thought that allowed guys like Mason Cole to get to the second level. I've been hard on Cole throughout the season, but I thought he played a really good game. And I just thought some of the slanting they did took Green Bay out of position and got guys like Jones and Cole to the second level out in space and getting hats on linebackers and, and, and blocking those guys up. So I thought that was pretty key overall. But yeah, just, you know, Harrison, Warren running hard. I, I didn't think the blocking scheme was overly complicated. It was kind of a lot of... Right toss plays um, and kind of inside zone and a couple of gap runs. And that was basically it, but that's all it needed to be. And this one was just kind of, let's be simple. Let's be uh, sound fundamentally. Let's get hat on hats, wash these slant slanting defensive linemen down, get to the second level, get hats on linebackers and, and let our running backs do the job. So just a good fundamental scheme overall. That might not have been Mason Cole's best game as a Pittsburgh steer, but it's got to be top three. Uh, I feel like after going back and watching, uh, watching tape. Now I, I do think the way they, they slanted some of the times helped play into that some, uh, with that. But once again, that's not his fault. His job mm -hmm. is to execute, uh, what happens. And he did, uh, I thought, so I thought a, a good game overall, uh, with him. Uh, what did you think about that fourth and one toss play? I to, might to, thought to the left side to Warren. Yeah, I mean, the thought is, if it works, hey, great <laughs> call. If it doesn't, why are you running a toss on fourth right. and one? So it, that is very much a results-oriented type of call for, for Matt Canada. Yeah, that, I was thinking that while going back through the All-22 uh, on that, thinking, holy moly, if that doesn't work on a, a on a toss like that, Canada's getting it. It might change – it might change the – uh, complexion of that game, giving up the ball in that, that, that part of mm -hmm. the field there, you know, uh, but you know, Alan Robinson did just enough, uh, get, I mean, first blocks against a big base base in, right. Or, you know, big yeah. guy, big guy on the end. And it's not like he spent a lot of time on that block, but he got just enough to slow that down and then gets out on the edge. And, you know, that, that block over there is not going to get him on sports center or anything like that, but it was just enough. And then you have, you know, I thought Pickens could have probably done a better job down the field on, on his block there, but it, uh, it, it was just enough to get just enough and more. Yeah, uh, they actually ran that, I think, twice. There were two short yardage toss plays they had run. I think the other one came on third down, not fourth down, but they saw something on tape where they wanted to get the ball on the outside. I bet the Packers being without Quay Walker helped. Kind of their, their sideline to sideline athletic linebacker probably makes that calculation easier. But yeah, I think because Pittsburgh has been kind of a dive team in those situations, they ran the tush push earlier in the game. Let's let's go toss in some of those moments. It's, it's a risk, but it, it worked, and that's all that really matters, I guess. Right. And it was thought, good, to see, I, good to see him get, get the 200. Yeah. I, I think Cole was really good at the run game. I thought pass pro was an issue. I thought Kenny Clark beat him a couple times, but they, they laid down like a, a new patch of grass in the middle of the field and guys were slipping the entire time. I don't know what the situation was there, but I think there were some footing issues, but I did think Cole struggled against Clark. Now Clark's a really good defensive tackle and he's got a bunch of sacks. So um, it's not, it's not like you're going against some, some third stringer, but I did think in pass pro Cole was not as strong as he was in the run game. Uh, we, we, you know, we've already given a lot of thoughts on the past game. 
yeah, I don't have a whole lot more to add there. Um, I mean, there wasn't, there's not a whole lot of thoughts to give. They didn't throw the ball much and it was a lot of short yardage, you know, check down type stuff. I mean, I think what two, at least I know after the first two drives, I think only two of Pickett's completions traveled more than what, eight yards in the air. So, and that was to, to Johnson and Pickens. So not a whole lot to even really discuss. It was really a run game that, that carried you throughout. Right. It All right, was. Dave, defensively, your thoughts here um, in, in this contest against Green Bay? Boy, T.J. Watt uh, didn't do a lot in the pass rush game overall, at least not, you know, not statistically at all. But, boy, that guy can that guy can play on the backside of plays, right? Chasing stuff down, mm -hmm. uh, flattening out. Uh, I, I thought Dan Orlovsky has a great video up uh, up on Twitter this morning talking about how uh, the guys on the other side and Highsmith and, 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 and Cam Hayward uh, did a good job of, of stagnating uh, and setting the edge over there that, that helped allow uh, Watt to chase from the backside. A lot of back backside uh, uh, pursuit and plays uh, by TJ Watt were, were impactful. And look, one of those that he made, you don't you don't know if uh, forget who it was that needed to try to come off the block on, on one of those. If TJ Watt doesn't make that backside tackle, that might bust for a home run. Yeah, those I think came mostly early in the game, I want to say. I think once through my tape study, there were a couple of good backside pursuits there. So, yeah, I know the pass rush was underwhelming. I think they played Watt and Highsmith far too much in this game. They did not do a good job rotating. We talked about that a lot on Monday, but still impacting the game in other ways. You know, his run defense does not really get the – it's like Minka's tackling. Like Everyone talks about Minka and his playmaking and interception, and, and rightfully so. Same with, you know, Watt and the sacks. You know, the sacks are there, but he plays the run really well. Tight ends can't block him. He chases the ball hard backside. And so even though it's not a particularly good game, um, I, I think he was he's still able to impact the game in the run game, which was important. Saw so Watt drop quite a few times in this game, too. Yeah, both guys did. I don't know. I, I, I have to kind of check maybe those situations. Typically, it's either against empty or twin receiver sets or a blitz where the nickel's coming and the backside guy's going to drop out. But it did happen a couple times. Do you think, not that I'm concerned about TJ Watt, but it felt like he had a tougher time winning the edge consistently against that Tom there right tackle. Do you think he needs to maybe vary up the moves a bit? Because I think guys are starting to sit on kind of that chop outside move. Uh, I mean, it's one game and he did get, you know, did get a, more, you know, get, get a sack, you know, kind of a cleanup, I guess, more, more than anything. But I, you know, I'm, it, it was what I expected more out of, out of this game, mm -hmm. but I, I think uh, on the flip side, I think Zach Tom has represented himself well overall so far this season. Yeah, no, he has. I, I did see Watt try the inside spin once. And so oh, I wonder yeah. if he's trying to pick that up from Highsmith a little bit. So not that I'm concerned. I just have that thought there. Cause I thought, you know, you're right. Tom did have a good game against TJ Watt. Not not an overly you know not an overly great game from a pass rush standpoint from the Steelers. I thought I think that was kind of evident early on uh, in this game. And correct me if I'm wrong. Some of their a couple of their explosive plays, especially in the second half, came after kind of just inability to 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 get pressure on the quarterback. Yeah, no pressure was not where it needed to be in this game where the Packers were from behind and, you know, love stone the ball, you know, 40 times and dropping back a couple of times more than a handful of scrambles. I mean, yeah, there were communication issues in the back end. You look at that 44 yarder to, excuse me, to Wicks. I think Casey's just out of position and he's got deep half there and just doesn't find the ball. So uh, it, it's both and it's coverage and rush, but you were really hoping in a game where your secondary's hurting and they got some good athletes at receiver and game circumstance, your pass rush, would have been able to do more and it, it it was there in moments but not the consistent pressure that i that i thought and hoped that it would be yeah look and when you're in zones they they, they seem to lose track of a couple of guys in zone situations when they weren't getting pressure and one of those was when 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 watt dropped into the middle of the field you know yeah and there were a couple of good concepts you saw that dagger concept mm -hmm. uh on that dig route against cover two for a bunch of yards i think later in the game one of those fourth quarter possessions that Green Bay had to got him chunk play. So um, Pittsburgh will have to do more than just play cover two. But I know when you're in the middle of a game, you, you're losing people, you're secondary struggling, you're trying to simplify things overall, and you're trying to kind of, you know, keep the ball in front of you. So we'll see what the game plan is against the Browns. Uh, that, you know, outside of the 40 yard run, you know, I, I thought they did a, 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 a really good job against Ron Atlanta. Roberts had, had a, had a good game playing coming downhill. Yeah. I, th I mean, it was the, 
I think first run of the game on that pull and he blows up the puller and basically knocks him into the running back and tackles Aaron Jones and talk about tone setters. I mean, just guys that see the pull and they attack and they get downhill. And, you know, I'm worried about a bit on play action and kind of, you know, over committing and being too aggressive, but that's Robert's style. Like that's the guy he's always been in and it, you can't blame him. He, he's what had a eight, nine year NFL career. He's going to you know always be that guy. It's what's gotten to this point of his football career. He's got what, two Super Bowl rings to, to talk about. So um, he's going to be the hammer, but you do worry about maybe him being a little over aggressive. How many communication busts did you, did you kind of observe here? Uh, that's a good question. Um, three, four. Yeah, probably. That sounds about right. I mean, that was an inverted cover, inverted cover two on that one down the seam to the tight end. Yeah, to me, I, I don't know if I even call that a coverage or bust. I just think Riley lost his man. Right. He kind of was looking in the backfield. Like, I think there were some coverage busts, but it was also just, you know, some soft spots in zones or guys not doing their job. On that Levi Wallace, really on both of them, but that first touchdown, do you think there was some miscommunication where Wallace thought Casey was going to have more outside help? It felt like Wallace was a bit late or really nobody was kind of playing outside leverage on that play. Well, yeah, he went, Dobbs went, went in motion on that one and then mm-hmm. comes off and gets to free release. And all that is like a smash, right? Yeah. Was there a flat route underneath that, uh, underneath the corner route? I can't remember the exact concept there, but there was some motion. It was the trip side. And it's I don't know. It's a fairly just, easy concept. And, you know, uh, as far as overall, now you mix the motion in with it and all like that. And he got the easy free release and Wallace is coming back, trying to run with him. And didn't Wallace slip a little bit? Uh, he might have, yeah. Uh, co- coming in there too, but but once again, what's the safety doing on that play? Yeah, I, I really just wasn't sure of the relationship between the corner and safety. Then the other one, again, I wouldn't necessarily call that a coverage or bust. I just felt like Neil was late to react, and Wallace is out leverage playing outside and is expecting some inside help, and it's not doesn't really come. So are those busts, or are they just kind of really? I mean, maybe Neil thought something else was happening. Maybe that could have been a coverage bust, but it just kind of felt like he was late. I just felt like guys were late with their eyes in this game. Well, look, they gave up eight explosive plays in this game, and I think only <clears throat> what just one was on the ground, that 40-yarder, right? Yeah, I think all the other ones came through the air. I mean, that's it's been a feast, it's been a feast or famine kind of on, on defensive side of football, right? They uh they're they're either getting a uh getting a key takeaway at the right time, uh, or they're they're doing a good job, you know, uh uh especially against the run, uh for the most part or they're giving up explosive plays. I've called them a splash defense. They're a splash mm-hmm. defense where they create splash plays and they allow splash plays. And you know, you're trying to find some more consistency. And as I said, Monday, if they can just if they can just eliminate the big plays in the pass game, this will become a really, really good defense. Um, but they gotta get to that point. Right. Uh you gotta you gotta make the grass shorter. Uh, overall, uh, when it comes to explosive plays. And then uh, I, I think once again, that played into some of these uh, explosive plays against the Packers is rushing coverage really weren't working good together. No, I think there are issues on both sides there. So that, that probably sums up the uh, defense. Well, special teams, again, shout out to Patrick Peterson with that field goal block. He talked about that on his uh, All Things Covered podcast and just timing that. The wing never really you know bumped him and he's able to kind of get a pretty easy relatively speaking, field goal block or extra point block off of that to keep things at four point game, which proved huge late in that contest. And um, just kind of watching just the violence and some of the collisions. I had a video today just kind of talking about that, man, special teams can be pretty down and dirty. Broderick Jones, I, I think field goal protect is the worst job in the world, Dave. Mm-hmm. Like you just get the crap kicked out of you. You got to take it to allow that kick to get uh, to get kicked off, obviously. But it's just it's a it's a messy job. Yeah, and then we talked about the kick coverage the other day. It was one of the concerns I had coming into this, and they 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 obviously could have done a better job on kick coverage. Yeah, I mean, I get, I feel a little bit better about the strategy of it. I don't think it was they they missed some tackles. They just have to tackle. I mean, right. Riley missed one. I think um, somebody else I think missed one on that long return that Nixon had. They do those things. It doesn't look as bad, but the risk is, you know, do you trust those guys to tackle? You got an all pro returner who probably is able to break some tackles. So, you know, different discussion, but. It didn't kill this team. All right. Uh, anything left over from the game there? Nope. That covers it pretty well. Um, anything else here that you want to address here today, Dave? Uh, I, th- uh, I think we got most of the topics. We can get to some emails, right? Yep. Let's get to a couple of radio emails and close out today's show. 
All right, Haslam writes in, hi, David, I'll share my thoughts on what the Steelers need to do big picture with Kenny. Give him the starting job, one. Give him the starting job through 2024, two. However, in this upcoming draft, <coughs> heavily scout quarter, quarterbacks, if he has not shown progress with the intentionally intentionally or potentially targeting a quarterback that may slip like like Levis in Tennessee or when Russell Wilson slipped years ago, cut Mitch Trubisky and either bring in a rookie as stated above or, or a very capable backup, potentially even someone to push picket. Uh, if they go, if they get to eight, three or nine and four and have a playoff spot nearly locked up, begin to open up the offense, encourage him to take risk. If, if he then shows progress, perhaps, perhaps we can build off of that moving forward. I'm not so I, I don't, I don't think you should let record, I mean, because look, are, are they really going to have a playoff spot locked up? <laughs> I don't know. The way some of this AFC stuff going, maybe they will three games out. I don't know. But but uh, uh, I think that's looking too far ahead to say if they get to eight and three or nine and four uh, to, to, to change, to encourage him to take more risk and all. He's just got to play better, period. Yeah, I don't think it's the record. It, it seems going to be so tight throughout that. You know, you're not really trying to change. If you're eight and three and it's working, you're not going to dramatically change the model. Um, there, there are going to be times where you can take risks and th those things are going to come up kind of organically, naturally in game. Again, I just want to see Pickett do some of the routine things to start and just start kind of getting back to that foundational quarterback play. And he's doing some of that in terms of taking, I think he's taking a profit better. I think he's hitting the check down more often. He's taking, you know, again, good care of the football overall, but just some of the accuracy, some of the stuff that's there for the taking that's going to put some points on the border or, you know, move the sticks on third down. I just want to see him do those things a lot more consistently. Uh, as far as number one, I don't think you have to worry about uh, starting job. I mean, he's going to be your starter through 2024 and hopefully, hopefully longer if he can turn this thing around. Uh, upcoming draft and heavily scouting quarterbacks. I mean, you might scout quarterbacks just to, just to be in the process of it. And look, I, even I have said, you know, would it hurt my feelings if this team took a, uh, you know, of a fifth or sixth round quarterback. It just, I mean, you're going to have so many needs once you get by the time you, 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 you roll through this thing. I'm not expecting them uh, to draft a quarterback. If they did draft a quarterback, it'd probably be seventh round or, or something like that. Again, as far as Mitch Trubisky goes, I, I think Mitch Trubisky is overpaid uh, at, at, at this point, you know, so I, I don't, they could they could potentially use some of that cat cat space, but what what what's going to be the alternative there, and and would it be an upgrade versus cost? You know. Yeah, I mean, probably probably not overall. Um, I mean, the I mean, next I, the next backup quarterback that you that you probably they're probably good. You, their hope is to get back on the cycle of being the minimum veteran benefit contracts with these guys, right? Yeah, but backup quarterbacks are getting expensive. I mean, the position in general is, you know, it, it's not cheap. And so if you want a, a backup with some experience, th there's a cost to that. And yeah, maybe Trubisky you know, is probably making more than what ideally you would like to give him. And I've had my critiques of, of Trubisky and how he fits in this offense and being more that risk taker, more turnover prone for an offense that can't afford any of that. But A, I'm not spending much energy thinking about that right now. I expect Trubisky to be back in 2024. They value his experience, his leadership, you know, I think being a good teammate, good set of eyes and ears for Kenny Pickett. So all those things are going to keep Trubisky around. So that's kind of the, what, what matters right now. Charles uh, Munger writes in, Pickett should be bitched. Hi, guys. This isn't mean, uh, meant as a hot take. I argue that Pickett's stats are comparable to Desmond Ritter, and he has lost a privilege to start. Pickett is objectively uh, the worst offensive starter. Let Kenny watch the rest of 2023, and hopefully next year's new OC will resurrect Kenny for 2024. I'm open to starting Mitch or Mason, although Mason starting in Cleveland might not work for the, the, the distractions of the storyline. Uh, I don't know what to tell you, Charles. I mean, uh, I, I, I understand your, you know, this, and, you know, what, what you're trying to say here, but, uh, Look, Pickett's taking care of the football. You're winning still. Uh, you obviously would like to see areas of his game uh, get better, and you need these games for that to happen in uh, mm -hmm. uh, overall. You worry about to me next year's a next year's next year. You got to what you got to work through 2023 right now. Uh, the way that hero ball that Mitch likes to try to play 
you know, I don't think you have a lot of confidence over there. And obviously Mason's the third quarterback for a reason, you know, uh, here. So, uh, I, I think you're going to, I think you, I think you, you're going to have to sit through and watch Pickett start the rest of the way, Charles. Sure. And talk about distractions. You don't want to start Rudolph because of the distraction. How about benching your starting quarterback when you're six and three? That might be a, a distraction, might become a storyline, uh, I, I would uh, reckon to say. So, I mean, I'm not there on Pickett. I, I've critiqued Pickett, obviously did throughout this podcast some, uh, but he's got to try to work through it and try to get better. It'll be a tough task, though, Dave. This Browns defense is no joke. Uh-huh. And again, they're going to, they're going to, they know that everything's kind of on them right now. If they're going to start a rookie or whoever they're going to start a quarterback, whether it's Walker or, or DTR. They know this defense has to be even better the rest of the way, and they're already an elite level group. So this is going to be a big challenge. They're already aggressive as it is, and if they can yeah. get Kenny in some uh, uh, third and long, second and long situations, they're going to come after him, man. They're going to make him make some quick decisions to get that ball out. Yeah, they will for sure. And and I, yeah, I know the Steelers' rush rushing attack has been much better. I don't think they're going to run for like a buck 75 in this game. I think it's going to be much, much tougher sledding against Cleveland than it has been against Tennessee and Green Bay. So there's going to be more on picket to make these plays. 12, eight game, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. And take the under. I mean, that's kind of the way this thing's shaping up. Uh, Jeff Kinney writes in, hi, David Knox. Your podcast is terrible and I absolutely love it. Thanks for all <laughs> you do to educate us. Yenzers. Don't make the mistake that pol- political analysts, Make thinking that Twitter X users represent society Steeler fans. They tend to be opinionated, loudmouths to a large extent. Football is a team game, not an advanced metrics individual sport. Most Steeler fans enjoy the wins and suffer through the losses. Most of us would rather have a team win than a high-flying quarterback who throws an interception during crunch time. Perhaps we should trust that Mike Tomlin and his staff know a little more than we do about evaluating players and building schemes around their talents. Perhaps we should trust that Mike Tomlin and his staff, uh, let's see, of course, the Steelers can improve in virtually all areas, he goes on to say. Do you agree that the worst thing Kenny picked it can do is try to shut up the critics and end up forcing the ball into high risk areas like Mitch has done in a vacuum. Your last statement uh, is the worst thing that Penny can pick. It can do is try to shut up. You don't want him just throwing over the middle for the sake of shutting up his, his critics. You want him to throw over the middle because he sees something and is able to make those throws. Uh, look, the, the, we, can't we have both here, a, a guy making progress and and not turning the football over? I don't think that's that that's too much to ask about there. And as far as the analytics go, uh, Jeff, some of these things are hard to argue with. That's why there's so much why why there's so much talk about right now. Can you believe what the Steelers are doing? Uh, winning with some of the uh, analytics that are attached to it. Uh, look, I I, I think. The, the fact that they've been able to do this is a, a it's unbelievable. B somebody needs a uh, pat on the back for it, whoever you want to give it to uh, within that. But at its core, if you, if you believe in any type of law of averages and analytics, some of the analytics that we focus on as a whole, this thing is not sustainable. I mean, It's it they and to their credit, they have sustained the unsustainable to this point. And every game is a new game uh, at this point. So uh, how much does what has has have has have happened last week or the week before play in in, into this week? And and it it, it looks good on a bumper sticker. The the you know, the unsustainable being sustainable. but. Long story short, you have to start seeing, in my opinion, some improvements in some of these areas on offense. And I don't care how you do it with explosive plays. You've got to see more explosive plays uh, uh, come about here, uh, especially in the passing game. Uh, He has gotten away with some interceptable throws. You know, is that going to come back? Are we going to start seeing an increase on those actually get caught? You know, the main takeaway here. And we talked at the top of the show is we have to see Kenny start playing better, period. Sure. To, to the last point, yeah, the, the worst thing Pickett can do is even 
not just respond to his critics, but don't even look at the criticism. Don't, like, don't listen to anything that even you know I have to say or whatever you know, the internet has to say about about your play. Just focus on your job and what the coaches are telling you, what the game plan is. You tune out all this other kind of noise, you know, valid or not. Um, sure, we understand that Mike Tomlin and the coaching staff they they know more than us because they are in that building and they have a, a view that obviously we do not. We can still critique and analyze and give our opinion that's kind of what we've been doing for the last decade plus um i i don't dispute the model being built in terms of being able to win now in terms of you know have that high floor low ceiling let's grind it out let's hang around and be that team that can win that that rock fight is the the word we use so often but the question is can they win that in the playoffs when things really matter against more potent offenses and high scoring teams where your defense can't hold them to just 20 points and you win on the last possession. So the concern is less about can this team win and get to the playoffs? I think they certainly can. They're on track to do so. But what comes after that? Are they going to face that wall when they're going against the Bengals or Jacksonville or somebody that can put up points and bunches? Look, I, I can I can see the the outcry now, whether it be social media or email box or, or whatever. Uh, if Kenny Pickett throws one down the middle of the field more than 15 yards against the Browns and he gets picked off, it's going to be C, yo, mm-hmm. uh, should have should have played this small ball, you know. Uh, but at, at look, at some point, you're you're you've got to be able to push the football down the field. Maybe you know we're not looking for. 2000 and I don't know, pick, pick the, pick the year that Roethlisberger was really slinging it downfield or, or a few years or whatever, or, you know, whatever that was. Mm-hmm. We've, we've got to see, we got to see more out of Kenny Pickett period. I, I, and I think Mike Tomlin summed it up in his press conference yesterday with that one word. Certainly that's yeah, what we, we, we're not asking him to become you know, uh, hurts or, or Mahomes or anything like that. We've just got to start seeing more than what we've seen, uh, uh, right now. And, and more than just a little more, I think, I mean, we've got to see a, a couple of notches up and in, in his progression as a passer in the NFL. Yeah. Again, just do some of those routine things more routinely, more consistently. And when you get into a rhythm early, let's, let's, just, let's keep that going. Let's keep that flow going more than it has been the last two weeks. That, that's kind of what I'm looking for from Kenny Pickett right now. I mean, you look at some of these, 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 these raw analytics with this, you know, uh, e, you know, the, the, the successful play rate and uh, expected points and adjusting net yards per passing attempt. Those aren't great, Bob. Yeah. Um, they, they, sm- they, they, they spelled defeat most of the time. And right. once again, they are six and three They're and their record are, as Mike Thomas said, and Mike Thomas is not going to apologize after the, after games for winning these games the way he's winning them, nor should he, because sure. to win games in, an, in, in the NFL, no matter how you do it is a tough accomplishment. That's why I absolutely hate people talking about trap games in the NFL, because these are professionals. These are guys that can win on any given Sunday here. So what they have done is no small accomplishment here. You're just thinking, though, based on the analytics and based on what we know the game of football is even now, even with the lack of explosive plays you know, the last couple of seasons here, you still have got to be able to throw the football down the field somehow. Sure. Again, my concern is less about can they get to the playoffs this way? They clearly are in that direction. Not a guarantee. It's going to be a tough fight to the end, but they're they're in that obviously vicinity in that airspace. But what comes after that? And the goal for this team is not to, just to get to the playoffs. It is to win a playoff game, break the shroud, compete and be one of those AFC contenders. And I don't know if the model is trending that way, but, you know, as you alluded to, no team says, to heck with your analytics like the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, right. They are doing things that you really mathematically shouldn't, you shouldn't be getting the outcomes you're getting based on the inputs that you're putting in. The outputs don't seem to, to align, but that's the, uh, the value of this team that's able to win late and, and to grind these games out better than maybe any other, any other team in football. And look, no, it's not all on Kenny, you know, Matt right. Canada gets, gets obviously some, so, so, you know, blame along with this as well too, but uh, we have got to be able to see, more out of Kenny Pickett, whatever that more looks like with, with throwing the football and, and, and pushing the football down the field a little bit. Look, you know, 
outside outside of uh, Stroud, I mean, hey, you, you don't see a lot of quarterbacks throwing 22 times uh, more than, you know, or even 15 times to the middle of the field, you know, but when you're, when you're able to do that, you're able to, to complete a few of those and get some big plays that opens up all areas of the field. You know, sure. we're, we're not, we're not expecting six completions, you know, that, you know, but, but, uh, of, of, of 18 yards down the field between the numbers, every game, but we got to start seeing more than what we're seeing. Yeah, and to be fair, there isn't a ton of talent in the middle of the field. I mean, Robinson is very much a possession underneath guy averaging under nine yards per reception. I don't really know what Calvin Austin is other than the pure speed, clear out type of guy. You know, Fry has been hurt. Washington's not, you know, really been involved and playing pretty conservative with him. And, you know, Connor Hayward, maybe could be doing more with Connor Hayward. I'll grant you that. But I, I recognize that the, the, the most talent in his passing game exists on the outside with Deontay and with George Pickens. So, um, you know, I, I know that most of the plays are going to be made there, but can you try to scheme this up to get something between the the numbers that's going to be, I think required at some point. And, and, and look, it doesn't even have to be 12, 15, 18, 22, 32, 42 yards down the field there, you know, because look, if you have an average depth of target of eight yards in the NFL and you're completing passes at that number, things are probably going pretty damn well. Right. So mm -hmm. what I, you know, one of the things that, that you know, I'd like to see, and this is on Matt Canada as well, too. And we talked about this all off season going in, 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 in into this season, man, how about start hitting some people on the move at the seven, eight yard mark? Yeah. I mean, even a move, slant that moving, can take you moving in space towards the middle of the field instead of out breaking, because it seems like when he's completing these further ones down the field, uh, it's either a sit on, on, on some sort of zone or something like that, or it's an, or, or, or it's, or, or it's a screen to the outside, a dump off, or it's some sort of out route or a curl or a comeback on the outside, which gives you absolutely zero. So when he is completing these, these balls further down the field, not much is happening, uh, uh, after them. And then there's not enough. You're not having the volume on them also because, you know, you, you need those that, that get caught at, at the seven yard mark and end up going for 22 mm -hmm. yards. What does Deontay Johnson's yak situation look like this year? He's sitting at 4.8 yak per reception, which is very much in line. His That's first three years. Good. Yeah. Um, he was at 4.9 in 2021, 5.2 as a rookie, 4.5 in 20. 20. So he's back to kind of where it should be. But I do feel like the last couple of weeks, maybe the last two weeks, it hasn't been as much in terms of the yak opportunities for him. So maybe trying to get back to that's going to be, be helpful. Yeah. Look, you got to get both those guys. If they, if they get the matchup on the outside, you know, like we saw in, 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 against Jacksonville, you know, if you can get Pickens on a slant or if you can get Johnson on a slant, you know, you, you've got to read those. Uh, and look, does he, you know, you saw, you, you watch that Denver Broncos game the other night and you watch, uh, uh, the bills and all like that, all, all the, all the play changing and the checks and all like that. Do, does, does Kenny Pickett have that sort of autonomy? No, you know, right, and, right. and he's probably not going to have that, the, you know, the rest of the year. You know, at some point, obviously you'd hope if he's going to be your franchise quarterback, he's going to be able to, 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 to be a guy that goes up there and checks out of one thing into the other. So he is limited in that, that aspect there. So that puts more onus on Matt Canada to, to, you know, have more instances where there are more automatic sight checks and stuff like that, right? Yeah, I mean, you've seen, I've seen some improvement in terms of some adjustments in terms of making those checks and calls at the line. You go back to the Ravens game, that whole discussion on the touchdown to Pickens. I think about, oh, it was a touchdown that Najee had, that run play. I forget, against the Rams, I think it was, where he, I think Pickett, uh, Pickett checked into that run and, and they got the touchdown out of it, so... Um, yeah, obviously he's not Russell Wilson or Josh Allen and a veteran, you know, firmly established type of quarterback that's going to have maybe that, that type of control and that's expected, but I, I, there's, there's probably been some progress in terms of the autonomy. All right. Uh, we've spent a little bit of time answering a few emails here. We're running a little bit long here. Uh, obviously got some work to do. So why don't we kind of wrap it up here and get back after it on Friday? I think we're going to hopefully have uh, Scott Petrak, uh, uh, who covers the Browns, our normal beat writer to talk and help us get ready for that. And we'll have our picks and 
maybe we'll know who the Browns quarterback is uh, mm. for sure uh, by Friday. We'll have a better sense of maybe who's in and who's out for the Steelers on the injury report this week. So we'll have a lot of stuff to carry over and talk about on Friday. So in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteelersDepot.com. Hit the donate button, upright navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, SteelersDepot.com, uh, find the ad free button and follow the directions that way. So uh, until Friday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.